Good everybody. So I need to record a reasonably long lecture because we have to get ourselves set up for the exam on Friday. And as I was speaking about in class, well, <laughs> we got two choices. Either I record the missing material because I was lecturing too slowly, which is what I chose to do, or I end up recording the review session. And I feel like maybe it's a little bit more beneficial to have the review session live so that people can ask questions on their points of confusion. So since the review session is on Wednesday, we're going to have a recorded lecture now to basically make up for the entire lecture period that I am slow now. Okay, so what am I talking about today? I'm going to do a, just a little bit on metrics that I need to finish up, and then I'm going to talk about cross-validation. And in particular, I want to note that we have these notebooks, right? GitHub slash COGS118A notebooks. You will find these three notebooks, and these are filled with very useful information. So I've opened up uh, the metrics notebook, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I want to highlight a few things you should pay attention to. So this data set that I'm demoing here is a data set of um, microscopy, of microscope uh, measurements from cancerous cells and non-cancerous cells. So they look at underneath the microscope, uh, these cells, and you know, it turns out healthy cells may have a different look to them than cancer cells. And this data set, which is a very old data set actually, um, it has various measurements like the mean radius and some sort of texture measurement and the total perimeter of the cells and area of the cells and smoothness and compactness and concavity. They're measurements of the geometry, okay? So when we do something like this, we can see that there's a variety of these measurements and they have, you know, tiny numbers and big numbers for each one of these. So we want to predict, obviously, from these measurements uh, whether a cell measurement is for a cancerous cell or a non-cancerous cell. And if you look at these measurements, you will see that some of them have means that are like, I don't know, 0.04. And some of them have means that are like 654. So these couple of orders of magnitude should clue you in immediately that data that looks like this will probably do better if you standardize each column, right? Because we know that most kinds of machine learning algorithms that use linear algebra are going to maybe overweight a high magnitude uh, measurement in comparison to a low magnitude measurement. And just on the assumption that if what you actually believe is that these two measurements are not inherently, like it's not inherent that area is better at predicting cancer, right, than whatever this is, mean fractal dimension or mean number of concave points. Maybe these are just as good at predicting the, the cancer. So we want to make sure that the low magnitude points can do that. And the method to do that is to turn each one of these columns from whatever, from 143 to, to 2500, instead into a z-score, where each number is replaced by how many standard deviations away from the mean of that column it is. Okay, so how do we do that? We can get a standard scalar out of scikit-learn and 
we can take the training data and fit it and then turn the x values into z-scored values by doing a transformation on the fitted uh, scalar. Okay, critically you'll note that once you have fit, so we fit here on the training data, then I transform the training data, and then I transform the test data without refitting. Why? Because if you fit your scalar on the test data, you are overfitting. You are leaking information from the test set into the training set, right? So you don't fit the scalar with the test set. You don't fit the scalar with both train and test. You fit the scalar with the training set. And then you use the fitted scalar on both train and test. Okay? Because the getting any test set into the scalar is going to leak information and allow you to overfit. Okay. Uh, I don't want to go too much into details other than that. I just want to note that Scikit implements some lovely displays for you. So you can get your confusion matrix and your rock curves and a precision recall curve all from these methods. You, you're going to do best to explore this on your own. You don't want to listen to me go blah, blah, blah about it. Okay, but at any rate, here is, here's a function. You could hijack this for your projects. I don't mind. But um, certainly you want to become familiar with these functions and use the scikit docs. Now, here's something else I want to point out. So here in the beginning, I said, hey, let's use logistic regression to train on the scaled um, well, on both the unscaled and the scaled uh, cancer data. And what you're going to see is an error that says, oops, I hit the maximum number of iterations. What does this error mean, the convergence warning? Well, remember what we're doing is gradient descent on the log loss. That's what a logistic regression is. So in gradient descent, well, we need some sort of convergence criteria. When do we stop descending? And very typically, and in scikit-learn, as is typical, we have a couple of criteria. And those criteria are things like, oh, the size of the step I took is smaller than whatever, some tiny, tiny threshold, or the you know the gradient you know the the point is is that the 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 going in the negative gradient takes you a tiny tiny step or you haven't hit the i took a small enough step bit but i've reached a maximum number of iterations and this maximum number of iterations on the gradient descent is just to keep you from going forever which can happen in some problems okay so if the solver isn't converging, well, we have a couple of options. We can try different kinds of solvers, or we can just up the maximum number of iterations. And that's what I opted to do, upping the maximum number of iterations to 10,000 from its default of, I think, 1,000, if my memory serves. Um, turns out to be just great. Now, remember that what we did here is we fit the unscaled data, and here we fit the z-scored data. So which one's better? Well, I'll let you explore that on your own. But I want you to show you, right? Here's a confusion matrix display. Here is a... Uh, Area, uh, a receiver operating characteristics curve, and it also shows you the total area under the curve. 
And here is the precision recall curve. And we talked in previous class about what that should look like, right? What is, remind yourself, what is a chance level performance in a receiver operating characteristics curve? Well, it's a diagonal line. So this is definitely better than chance. What's chance level performance on precision recall? It's a horizontal line at 0 0.5. So this is very clearly better than that as well. Okay, so I'll let you explore this a little bit more on your own. Please do that. But I think I covered everything I really need to get to here. Oh, maybe one other thing to notice. Here at the end, I was saying, hey, can we add regularization to a logistic regression? The thing is, is that we can. But one thing to note here is, okay, so if I add C value, um, so just, just to be clear, there are two ways to add uh, regularization. Typically, you'll see either the regular loss, like OLS, plus lambda times a norm of the weights. Well, there's a different way to write that, which is a C term, another constant, on the main loss, OLS, and no constant on the weights, where all you've got to do to see that these are absolutely equivalent is to realize that C has to be 1 over lambda. Okay, there's just two different conventions on doing this. We have very typically talked about the lambda convention. The C convention is something that you're going to see when we talk about support vector machines. And, well, you know, scikit-learn implements C instead of lambda for logistic regression. Okay, so when we make C bigger, we're actually reducing the strength of the regularization because C is making the OLS term or the log loss term bigger. This shouldn't say log it. This should say log loss. My bad. I'm sorry about that. Maybe I'll fix it tonight. Um, okay, so whatever, we can add a C term when creating our logistic regression, and it creates a regularization penalty. Now, there are a variety of penalty terms we can do here. We can do an L2, or we can do an L1. One thing you'll notice is, is that there's different solvers, right? Gradient descent is a procedure, but you need an algorithm to implement gradient descent. And that algorithm, well, there's different algorithms to do it. We're going to chat more about this after the exam. But in this case, there are different algorithms for doing gradient descent. You should 100% read the scikit-learn docs and understand a bit about that. Okay? But you will also find in the docs that some solvers can do different things. So if the default solver was uh, set up here somewhere when we had the convergence problem, it's L LBFGS, LFBGS. Man, I always forget the acronym. LBFGS. Yep. Um, so that solver um, is the default solver for logistic regression. And that solver cannot do an L1 penalty. So in order to do that, when you look at the docs, you'll see that the Saga solver can indeed do an L1 penalty. So different solvers don't just give you different answers, because they will. They also have different speeds at which they work. One of them may need more iterations to converge than another. They may, one of them may take a different amount of time on the clock 
to get a solution. And different solvers also have different abilities, like whether or not you can add an L1 regularization. Okay, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about in this notebook. Again, explore on your own. I just wanted to point out things you should pay attention to. So let's go over to uh, across um, to uh, to looking at notebooks. So everybody in this class kind of already knows cross validation, but let me make it clear. So in general, you may have um, different sizes of data set. And if you have a situation where you've got like, you know, two trillion data points, you got like all the videos on YouTube, well, you're not gonna do cross-validation. You're just gonna make a training set and a validation set and a test set the way we've been talking about, and you're gonna be done. Why is that? Well, with two trillion data points, I mean, you've got a really good sample. And, and I'm pretty sure at that point that you're not going to have any issues seeing either enough weird data in your training set or your test set. So you're going to, you know, all the different kinds of things that can happen in your data are going to happen in large sample sizes because that's the whole nature of statistics. That's why we want large sample sizes, because it helps you make better estimates, because you'll see one of every possibility, at least. Okay, that's a relatively rare situation. Even in deep learning, there may be situations where your data is more limited than you would hope. And especially when we're working with tiny little regressions or stuff like that, we're often in these toy problems like the cancer data set. We only have a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand data points. So you probably want to make every single data point really count. So we have different procedures for estimating when we have large amount of data or small amount of data. Okay, so maybe I should take a moment and remind you what I mean by estimating. So when we get test set performance, right, the error on the test set here, well, when we have that, it is interesting and uh, conceptualization to realize that the idea of a test set is something you've never seen before. So your performance on it may be worse than the training set. Well, that gap between your training set performance where you're overfit on the noise and your general is, and your test set performance where you've never seen this particular data points, that gap is called the generalization error. So in general, training set performance will always be better than test set, and the gap between training and testing is called generalization error. So if you have a huge amount of data, right, you just randomly assign samples to be part of the training set or the test set. You don't, as I've said before, just chop it because there could be sequence. You've got to randomize and send these data points over there and those data points over there. Okay. You, maybe you don't have as much like as two trillion data points, but you got a fair number of data points, but maybe you'd like to do a little bit better. Well, you could do training and testing repeatedly, each time reshuffling the data so that different data points ended up in training set when you did it the first time. And when you did it a second time, you'd have different points here as before, just a reminder, every single data point in all the data ends up in one of these two sets, in training or in test, but not in both. Okay, it's critical that data points cannot be in both training and test set. 
By the way, just a reminder, sometimes we will do training set, validation set, and test set. What's the difference between validation and test? Validation is a set for hyperparameter selection. What if we want to figure out the optimal K for K nearest neighbors? What if we want to figure out the optimal lambda or C for a regularization? We're going to use performance on the validation set to do that. But in the end of the day, what we want is we want an estimate of how well we're going to do in the future. And when we do that, that's a test set. Okay. Any rate, returning to K shuffle splits, where instead of doing just one train test set, we can do this repeatedly K times and take as my testing set error the average of all of these test sets. Okay, just take the average, all these test sets, you're done. Now, one thing here is that, you know, like some data points will randomly be more commonly in the test set than in the training set. So this is, you know, like a sampling with replacement kind of thing. And we can do sampling with replacement explicitly as another kind of method to evaluate performance. So um, remember the bootstrap in the preview video? So the bootstrap is sampling with replacement. When we sample with replacement, we can take a data point out of our sack of data points and put it into the training set. But Afterwards, we put that data point back into the sack. So you see orange is here again on step two. And then we draw another data point, and then maybe later we draw the first data point a second time, so that data point occurs multiple times in our training data. So you can show, as I did during the, uh, the pre-video, that Essentially, 36% of points are not going to be chosen at all when you build a bootstrap sample. And that means 63% of points are going to be in the bootstrap sample, potentially sometimes more than once for each data point. But do you see these 36% that don't make it in? They are a built-in test set. So if you construct bootstrap samples instead of just random shuffles, then you have the 36% roughly of data points that were left out in constructing the bootstrap. And so we can use them out as, as a test set. So you can build a bootstrap set out of all the data, and then you have your out of bag set. And then you do that again, completely from scratch, right, with a different reassignment of bootstrap sampling in the training set and the out of bag set for the test. So because you have repeats in a bootstrap sample, right? Multiple data points that appear multiple times in the training set. This is a biased system. However, it's biased in a very particular way the estimates produced here can be corrected by a little bit of math. So by essentially creating this mixture uh, parameter that mixes the out of bag error with the training set error, you can construct an estimator which is basically unbiased and produces a good estimate of the true test set error. Now, why am I showing you this? Just to put it in context, right? The idea of K shuffle splits is just trying to do this procedure multiple times to get a better estimate, right? Take the average of something. This is an averaging of the out of bag with the training set in a way which kills the bias from doing the system, but why even do it? Well, it turns out 
that bootstrap sampling is used in some very particular machine learning algorithms, notably random forests. And random forest training is often done this way. Okay, we will see more of random forests in probably two weeks. Okay, lastly, we have what everybody's been waiting for, the K-Folds cross-validation. In many ways, K-Folds cross-validation is the gold standard. It's like what people just kind of do by habit when they do machine learning. So what is K-Folds cross-validation? Again, you've probably seen this multiple times, but let's just remind you, we take all the data and we have a hyperparameter K, which we can choose. In this particular case, we have five. K equals five. We chop the data up into five folds where data points are randomly assigned. So this data point over here might be in fold two and this data point over here might be in fold five, right? Once we've chopped the data up into these five chunks of equal size, right? 20% of the data is here, 20% is here, 20% is here. So now we're going to, if there's K folds, in this case five, then we're going to train the machine learning system those K times. So we're gonna train it once, twice, three times, four times, five times. And on each one of those trainings, we're going to use four fifths of the data as training set and one fifth of the data as a holdout. So why am I calling it holdout instead of test set or, or validation set? Well, the reason I'm calling it holdout is just because you can use it either way. Let's be really clear here. Cross validation can be used as a procedure to estimate test set error, or cross validation can be used as a method to use as a model selection. And in that case, we're doing validation, right? We're trying different kinds of modeling, which is what we're gonna talk about in next time I see you, right? We're gonna talk about model selection. So if I'm trying to pick what's the right um, regularization lambda, right? I'm trying to pick the right lambda for regularization. Then I'm using this holdout as a validation set to pick the ideal um, lambda parameter. Okay, so again, each time of these five times, I'm gonna train on fourth fifths of the data, use this holdout for validation or test, whatever I'm doing, and I'll do it again. I'll train on this four fifths, and now this one is the holdout. So because every single fold gets a turn as the holdout, Every single data point gets one turn as the holdout. Every single data point gets four turns in the training set. Okay, so critically, these different folds, right? Like these, when we do the first split, when we train on this four fifths and test on this four fifths, this, this fifth, and then later we test on this four fifths. Note that folds three, four, and five are common between these two trainings, between these two splits. What's different is fold two or fold one in the training set. So there's a lot of overlap in the training sets here, right? There's three fifths overlap or I mean, I guess when you look at the training set, it's three quarters, sorry. So there's three quarters overlap between any two pairs of splits. We're going to see that in just a few minutes, what that means. Okay. So how do we estimate test set performance or validation set performance? Well, we take the average 
of the performance on these five holdouts. Okay, that's what this is, the average on the holdouts. That's your test set error or your validation set error, however you're using this. Now note that we can change the number of folds. And every time we change the number of folds, we're also changing the number of splits, how many times we train. So if we choose three folds, then we're training three times. And if we choose five folds, we're training five times. And if we choose a hundred folds, we're training a hundred times. And you very quickly realize that as those numbers get big, you have a lot of training time that's going to occur, right? If your algorithm is super slow to train, like a big neural network, you're probably not doing 100-fold. And there's also a limit. That k can go up until it reaches the number, number of samples. When k equals the number of samples in the data set, so if the data set has 300 samples, when k is equal to 300, what you're doing is, is you're training on every single data point except one. And every single data point gets one and only one turn as the holdout in leave one out cross validation, right? But it has K minus one turns as training set. Okay. So remember our old friend, the bias variance trade-off. The bias variance trade-off happens in cross-validation. So remember how I said when k gets big, we train a lot more? But I want you to notice what happens. If k gets big, then you have more of these bits, but each bit has fewer data points in it, right? So if we had 20 data points, sorry, 20 folds, versus five folds, then each one of those folds is going to have one quarter as many data points in it. Because, you know, five times four is 20, right? So five fold cross validation, each one of the folds has four times more data points in it than 20 fold cross validation. Okay. Let's understand the bias variance trade-off in terms of cross-validation. Remember, we've talked about this in the past. Anytime you do statistics, when we have a biased system, it necessarily has low variance. And when we have an unbiased estimator, it necessarily has higher variance. So how does that work in cross-validation? It turns out that when we have a large number of folds, we have a biased system. Why is it biased? Well, it, uh, wait, oh wait, sorry. My bad, I'm, I'm thinking of this wrong. So uh, when we have uh, a 20-fold setup, right? Then we have 19 twentieths of the data in training. And every single one of these splits, every single time we, of those 20 times we train it, there's huge overlap between, in the samples in each one of those trainings. Right? Think about the, what happens when we're doing leave one out cross validation, when we get k all the way up to the number of data samples. In that case, only one data point changes between the different goes of training. Between two successive goes, just one data point is changing in the training set. That means the data set is highly biased in terms of the sampling. Right? That is, there's very low variance between the different uh, splits 
each split looks a lot like every other split because high K value, okay? The training sets are super similar. They're biased towards the training data, the whole of the training data as K gets very big. Okay, in contrast, having a low number of splits, like a fourfold, means that there is a significant difference between each training set, right? Two training sets on fourfold cross-validation, each one of them, they're only going to share two-thirds of the data. A third of the data will be different from training set to training set on those splits. So smaller uh, number of folds yields greater variance in the training sets. And therefore, because of the high variance, we have lower bias. Okay. But the situation completely reverses when we talk about error estimates. Right? The fourfold um, cross validation, which had more variability of fit, has less variability of error. Why is that? Well, because of that greater variability of fit. So the fourfold, if we do um, if we do this procedure where we're trying to estimate a validation curve, right? So in the, this is a validation curve. This is the degree of a polynomial. And this is the R squared metric, right? And in this validation curve, you're going to see that 20 fold cross validation, we get a lot of um, like we can, it seems like the best performance is reached at degree four and performance drops off as we start to overfit with high degree polynomial regression. Okay. In contrast, if we do exactly the same regression, but we do it with a five fold or a 10 fold cross validator, it seems like there's a bigger range of degrees where performance is roughly the same. So here is the fourfold cross validator, roughly speaking. Actually, it's a threefold, so it's not exactly the same. But, you know, when you looked at the fourfold here, something I should have pointed out is like if we repeatedly make a polynomial fit on a on a you know a true line like this green line you'll see each one of these red lines is a polynomial fit on 30 data points which is what would happen if we took a fourfold cross validation of 120 data points right no wait uh sorry fourfold cross validation on 40 data points i can't think anymore Right, fourfold would mean three quarters of the data, which would mean 30 data points, right? Whereas if we take 40 data points and we divide it up by two, by 20, sorry, then uh, by 20 divisions, then each one of those divisions is two data points. And so uh, the holdout is going to be two data points. So 40 minus two is 38, right? So with 38 data points and to fit, we have those lines, all those red lines, when we do this repeatedly, they look much closer to each other with a couple of weirdo things that happen, but mostly they're all laying on top of each other right here, okay? Um, the fourfold, well, you can see a lot more weird things happening here, right? You can see that, especially over here and up here, you can see a greater variability compared to that 20-fold. Okay. So 
And again, now that I finally actually explained these graphs properly, you can see that with the um, 20 fold cross validation, the, va the validation curve as we change degree of polynomial looks different than the lower, the lower folding. Why is that? Well, it's because this fourfold cross validation, it has a greater variability of fit, but that means the estimate variability is lower. Why is that? Because whereas we had a, um, a highly variable fitting, here we have a high bias estimate because we are biased because we're using relatively less of our data on the test set. Sorry, um, sorry, I said that wrong. Relatively more of our data on the test set. Because we have more of our data in the test set, because we have a quarter of our data in the test set here, and only, you know, one twentieth of our data in the test set here, so the test sets have more overlap. The test sets between the different splits, they, um, you know, they're getting closer to the distribution of the training set itself because you're a significant chunk of the training set at a quarter of it, right? So we're biased a little bit more towards our data sample. And because we're biased towards our data sample, we have lower variance by definition of the bias variance trade-off. So our different, like going back here, right? For fourfold cross-validation, each one of these holdout estimates is gonna look more similar to each other. These four holdouts are gonna look more similar to each other than when we have 20-fold. We have 20-fold because just two data points in each one of these folds. These errors can look radically different between the different splits because there's only two data points in each one of them. So if you get a wacko data point in the test set, in the, the holdout set, well, you're going to get wacko results. Okay? So low variability in the training set means high variability in the test set and vice versa. So this is an interesting phenomena. That means the estimates of threefold cross-validation have less variability than the estimates of 20-fold cross-validation. And when we get to leave one out cross-validation, oh my gosh, it is wacky. You get so much variability from leave one out cross validation that it, even though it's an unbiased estimate of the true, in fact, leave one out cross validation is completely unbiased, right? It has l no bias whatsoever. But the variability is so high in leave one out cross validation that you can actually end up having that variability swamp the bias, lack of bias. And you can get a bad estimate of performance with leave one out cross validation. So all this bias variance trade-off stuff, you're probably gonna wanna ask me questions about this. I'm realizing this is the kind of thing now that I'm talking about it without you being here that people have a lot of questions on. So we'll have to try to answer them, but just keep in mind that what's biased, what has high bias and what has high variance flips depending upon when you're looking at training set and test set. And that leave one out cross validation and high number of folds can be so bad at variability of the estimate that we actually recommend you avoid them when possible. If you have 
tiny amounts of data, you may need to go to 20-fold cross-validation or even leave one out. But when you do that, know that that variability can absolutely murder you later. And your generalization estimate well, it might be pretty bad just because that variability can be so high. Okay. So, slides. Now, let me point out that we have a cross-validation... Oh, model selection? No, I didn't want that one. Lecture 11 cross-validation. Why is its name Lecture 19 model selection? Pretty sure I opened up... Oh, because it's in... Sorry. It's because I'm using an old repo here. Um, any rate, yeah, if you click on it, the name of this is going to change if you click on the collab the way I did. Uh, but don't worry, this is actually this notebook. It's just um, from a previous quarter. It used to be Lecture 19. Okay. So what I wanted to show you is again you're gonna have to do this on your own I've only got a few more minutes before I hit 50 when I really want to stop so you should explore these notebooks read them carefully but let me point out some important things for you to explore do you remember how every single time we get data, what we're going to end up doing is creating features out of that data? And those features typically have been things like polynomial features for polynomial regression, or maybe a standard scalar like I was talking about in the beginning of this, right? And you're going to transform the raw data using some features. And then only once you've done that can you feed those transformed features into a model to do fit and predict on. It gets to be too much work, right? Scikit-learn is for lazy people like me. And what if I wanted to take all of these things, take the raw data, transform it into features, and then feed it into a particular kind of machine learning algorithm. And I wanted that all in one step. So I could just do fit, and it would both transform the data and set up the machine learning algorithm, train it. Well, I can do that. There's this thing called a pipeline. Scikit-learn's pipeline is exactly to do this. Pipelines are ways to make a sequence of scikit-learn estimators, where the first estimator is maybe a polynomial feature transform, and then the second scikit, you know, second estimator is a linear regression. And those two things together make a polynomial regression. So how does this work? So you define a new function which returns a pipeline, okay? And in making the pipeline, you can just give it commas to separate out the stages of the pipeline. So, hey, here's the first stage in the pipeline. It's a polynomial feature of degree whatever. Note that in my function, I had degree as an argument with a default. Now, if you override degree equal to 2 by saying degree equal to 9, you'll get a ninth degree polynomial because that will pass degree into polynomial features. Note that also here I have star star keyword args. Keyword args, if you're not familiar in Python, is a way to pass an arbitrary number of arguments, unnamed arguments 
of any number of arguments between zero and, I guess, infinity? I don't know. Okay. So, at any rate, this setup will take those keyword arguments. If you pass in any other arguments, and it will put them as arguments to the linear regression creation. Pretty cool, huh? So maybe you'll have a different kind of pipeline. One which is, oh, I'm going to standard scalar all the real numbers, and I'm going to one-hot transform all the categories, and then I'm going to fit a logistic regression. You can do that with those three things happening in a pipeline. At any rate, you should definitely read the docs on pipelines, and you should use them because they make your life easy. Look at this. Once I've defined this polynomial regression, one step to create a polynomial regression, hey, look, here's that fit intercept equals false. That's a keyword arg. It's not named. It goes into keyword args, and keyword args gets passed into linear regression. Pretty snazzy. That means fit intercept false goes into the linear regression. Okay, so look at this. This dumb graph I made, it tries first degree, third degree, and twelfth degree polynomials and fits it to the same data and plots it over the top here. And you can see how that turns out. Okay. So, if we want to do selection of which polynomial degree would give us the best fit, right? If you use your eyeball meter here, maybe you will decide that the third degree polynomial looks like it's maybe the best fit here. And the 12th degree looks overfit and the first degree looks underfit. But your eyeball meter is not the judge. What you should be doing is you should be doing cross-validation and using cross-validation as a validation set for selecting the degree of polynomial. And then you use the error on these different fits and you pick the lowest error on the validation set using cross-validation. Okay, how can you do that? Well, as I said, scikit-learn is for lazy people. It implements k-fold cross-validation for you. You just have to import it. Okay, I can tell I'm going over 50 minutes. I'm sorry, people. I'm just going to plow on. So the k-fold cross-validator takes an argument, number of splits. Again, you should look at the docs. And the way that works is you tell a k-fold cross-validator to split all of the data. This is all of the data. And it's repeatedly going to give you four-fifths of the data in training and a fifth. Oh, sorry. I said that wrong. This is a fourfold. So it's going to give you uh, two-thirds of the data, three-quarters of the data. Come on, math. Three-quarters of the data in training, a quarter of the data in holdout, repeatedly in this for loop, with each data fold having its turn as the holdout inside this for loop. So, four times we're going to fit on the training set. Four times we're going to predict using the holdout set. And we're going to stick those four predictions into a long array. And at the end of the day, we have the truth, what should have been, we have the predicted values, and therefore we can calculate the error. Again, remind yourself that in all the metrics stuff from scikit, true is the first argument, predicted is the second argument. Okay, so here is 
fold one, we have 1.46 error. Fold two, we have 1.17. Fold three, we have 1.86. And the average across all of those is 1.56, 1.57 really. Okay, so I wanna show you, this is exactly the same polynomial regression, right? Third order regression, third order regression. The only difference is this is a four-fold split. This is a 20-fold split. I'm not going to print every single one of those 20 folds, but look at the average. The average is 1.53 versus 1.57. This one is lower. This one is lower because the estimate is more variable. This one has higher bias. This one has less bias. This one is biased and it estimates a higher error. This one is unbiased or Oh, not unbiased, I'm sorry, less biased, and it estimates a lower error. However, we also know that even though it's less biased, it is also the case that the variability in each one of those 20 folds can be so huge that even though there's no systematic bias here, we could have a random event such that this error estimate is actually not as close to the truth as this one, right? This is exactly the notebook that generated the graphs inside the slideshow, okay? So you can see the greater variability of fit at fourth order, but, sorry, on greater variability of fit uh, on the 20-fold 20 20 here. I got myself all confused. All right, um, greater variability of fit here on the 4-fold. Oh, no, this is 100-fold. Wow. Okay. No wonder that's way more variable. What am I doing here? Oh no, both of these are a hundred. These both of these are a hundred fits, but it's on um, either thirty-eight data points, which would be like twenty-fold in terms of the number of data points, or it's on thirty data points, which would be like fourfold. Man, I'm sorry for being so confusing. Okay. So the last part of cross-validation, just a reminder, you can manually loop over a cross-validator, collect all the predictions, collect all the trues, calculate a score, print it out. Or you can remember that scikit-learn is for lazy people. I wanted to show you what's going on when you take the lazy option. If you want to get a score for cross-validation, all you've got to do is pass in a model and all of the data and a number of folds you want, in this case five-fold, with an optional argument of using a particular scoring mechanism and it will give you here the output of five folds of cross-validation on this model, right? You don't have to do this big loop over here and collect it all yourself. That loop is happening for you inside cross-validation score. Okay. Again, you should be 
looking at this yourself, playing with it, seeing what this stuff is. It's going to take you more than an hour probably to really understand this. Again, here we have validation curves that I'm generating with different kinds of model and with different kinds of cross validators on the same models. And you can see this difference between high numbers of fold cross validators and low numbers of fold cross validators. Like that graph that I stuck into the slides showing you that 20 fold appears to be way more sensitive and high degrees don't look very good. Whereas high degrees look just fine in smaller number of folds. Okay. Again, these are all results of the bias variance trade-off. All statistical estimators are affected by the bias variance trade-off. You should read this and uh, enjoy. Definitely make sure you're mostly good with this before the test or maybe before the review so you can ask questions about it. All right, everybody. I hit an hour. My apologies. Good luck. Bye.